Hi, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory, and I want to talk a little bit about a paper that we just had published and walk you through the results and see if it may be um, helpful to you in uh, treating your condition. Now, this paper is about Gulf War illness, and here's the paper. It's called Fatigue and Pain Severity in Gulf War Illness is Associated with Changes in Inflammatory Cytokines and Positive Acute Phase Proteins, and this is by my uh, senior medical psychology student, Kathleen Hodgen, and it was published in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. So this paper is not open access. We try to make all of our papers open access so anyone in the world can get a hold of them. Um, sometimes the grant ends before we can get the paper published, and it costs about three to $4,000 to get a paper published. I don't know if that sounds like a lot or not to get it open access, but if we publish 10 papers a year, that's like $40,000. And so it's very expensive to make these open access. And so it's only available in medical libraries right now, but you may be able to get a hold of it. Uh, and eventually it'll, it'll probably be available to everyone. But anyway, I wanted to at least um, tell you what the paper was about and what we found. Again, it's about goal for illness. That's the condition where people who were deployed to the 1990-1991 Persian Gulf War um, were exposed to diesel particles and a lot of um, vaccines. And we don't know exactly what's causing Gulf War illness, but there's a lot of evidence that's related to immune or inflammatory issues. And so this uh, project is a process called daily immune monitoring that I've used for about 15 years. And it's where we take patients and they come into our lab every day for 25 consecutive days and we measure a lot of things in their blood every day and then they track their symptoms. And when we do that, we can map out their symptoms from day to day and then we can see if anything in their blood tracks with the ups and downs. Is anything higher on a bad day and then lower on a good day? And if we find something that does that, that tracks with the symptoms, there's a good chance that that is involved in the pathophysiology. And so this is one of those studies specifically in Gulf War illness. And we wanted to know what in the blood tracks with fatigue, muscle pain, and joint pain, which are three of the most common complaints with Gulf War illness. And so this only takes 12 people, which sounds pretty small, but it actually is a ton of data because each person comes into the lab 25 times. So it's a big statistical project and gives us a lot of good information, but it's a small group of Gulf War illness uh, participants. So let me show you the main results here and I'll tell you what it means and what we might do with this information. And so here are the results and there's three columns here. The first column is fatigue, second column is muscle pain, third column is joint pain. What you see on the left are all the different analytes that we looked at, all the things in the blood. So for fatigue, the first two are the things that were positively correlated with fatigue, which means they were higher on a bad day. And you can tell that they're significantly correlated because they're in bold. So the first one is C-reactive protein, and the second one is serum amyloid A. And these are two acute phase proteins. Now, acute phase proteins are agents that are produced very early in the inflammatory response. So anytime you have an inflammatory response to anything in there are hundreds or thousands of things that can prompt an inflammatory response, but these are the first things to be activated and they start the inflammatory process. So what this tells me is that the fatigue in Gulf War illness, at least in this group of 12 individuals, is associated with inflammation. Now, that is informative because there are lots of things that cause fatigue that have nothing to do with inflammation. But this is telling us that it does have something to do with inflammation. Now, it doesn't tell us what's causing the inflammation. And like I said, there's many things that could do that. And so it doesn't really indicate a particular treatment, but it gives us a few hints. So one, we may be looking at over-the-counter um, anti-inflammatory agents, uh, things like ibuprofen or aspirin. I'm not indicating any particular treatment, but it's something you may want to pursue with your physician. Um, also botanicals that reduce inflammation, and we're starting clinical trials to uh, test those. And we found a few like curcumin or resveratrol, stinging nettle, 
reduce inflammation and appear to help go for illness. And this may be the reason why is that they're reducing inflammation. Um, the other thing I would do is I would, if, if I had this pattern and these symptoms with fatigue, I would probably start to look for anything that I'm being exposed to daily that could be causing inflammation. The most logical culprit would be something in the diet, not necessarily a allergy, but a immune insensitivity where something I'm taking in a lot is causing a mild to moderate level of inflammation in my body. It can start in the gut and then kind of leak out to the bloodstream and cause symptoms like this. Just an example could be proteins in milk. I mean, it could really be almost anything. Gluten, you know, things like that are, are the most common, but there are many, many things. Like you can have an insensitiv insensitivity to almost anything that you eat. And so you may want to look at something in your diet that might actually be exacerbating the symptoms. So that's the first column. Let's look at the second one, and the second one is muscle pain, which is a very common complaint. Now, the interesting thing here, if you look at the three that are bolded, they're not the acute phase proteins. And so this doesn't look like a classic kind of inflammatory condition. So the things that are driving muscle pain appear to be different than the things that are driving fatigue. And that's very important to know. So if we look across the three that are correlated with bad days with muscle pain are MCP1, IP10, and leptin. So MCP1 is monocyte chemoattractant protein, and uh, IP10 is interferon gamma-induced protein. Without getting into details of what these actually do, uh, um, more than that, I want to tell you what they're typically associated with. We see this a lot with autoimmune and uh, rheumatologic conditions, things like multiple sclerosis, things like lupus. comes up a lot with... Uh, kind of autoimmune conditions that can affect the brain and cause central symptoms. And so this looks very different from the things that were causing fatigue. This looks to me like a rheumatologic issue, an autoimmune type of a issue. And so we would treat that very differently. Now, if you look at the bottom one bolded, which is leptin, I've been looking at leptin for about 15 years. I think this is very, very important. Leptin is an adipokine, it's produced by fat tissue, but it crosses the blood-brain barrier and it sensitizes microglia and causes fatigue and pain sensitivity. This pattern that I'm looking at here looks a lot like when I've examined people with fibromyalgia. And because this pattern to me looks so much like fibromyalgia, again, at least in this small group of patients, this is suggesting to me that things that help fibromyalgia may help these individuals with gulfrolinus. So if I had this pattern, again, I'm, I can't make any medical advice, but I would be looking at low-dose naltrexone, which is something that has not been tested much in gulfrolinus, but looks very helpful in fibromyalgia. And so it might help a good number of people with gulfrolinus. And there's some evidence that that's true. So if you haven't tried low-dose naltrexone, you may want to talk to your physician about trying it. It's still not well recognized, and so it can be hard to find someone to prescribe it, but at least it's worth uh, pursuing and trying because it, it could very it could help symptoms quite a bit for some people. Last thing is the joint pain, and then I'll wrap this up. The joint pain looked very similar to the muscle pain. The MCP1 came up, the IP10 came up, the uh, leptin came up again, um, and the SAA came up again again, from the fatigue. So there seems it seems to be a mix of fatigue and muscle pain. Probably what that means is that individuals with muscle pain probably also have joint pain. And, you know, that might, that might not be surprising, but actually it's informative. When your muscles hurt and your joints hurt, that rules out some conditions. And to me, when both of those hurt, it suggests to me that there's central, um, central involvement. So your spinal cord and your brain, something is exacerbating all the pain signals that are coming to your brain, and we call that central sensitization. To me, that really suggests microglia involvement, which exacerbates and strengthens those pain signals. If you have muscle pain and joint pain, my guess is that you're also going to have fatigue and you're also going to have some cognitive complaints. 
and uh, probably some mood complaints as well, motivation complaints. All these things work together, and I think finding the appropriate treatment would would help um, all of these symptoms. So that's that's the quick story. We may go into more detail later. There's not enough information in this small report to drive particular treatments. We do have another set of people who did this except over a much longer period of time. We're going to consolidate that information. And if the data from that second group matches this one, we'll be more confident that these analytes are involved in the pathology of gopher illness. So again, there's not enough here to for me to say, hey, I recommend this particular treatment right now. I do feel like it's getting us closer to understanding what the problem with gopher illness is. What I'm looking at right now is there's a group of people with gopher illness that have some kind of inflammatory condition. So we need to address that as an inflammatory condition that's chronic. And then another group that looks like they have more of an autoimmune type condition and we need to approach it that way. That is nothing new. Other studies have found that. So this is really adding to that evidence. So that's all for right now. We'll be talking a lot about gopher illness, especially since we have clinical trials starting early 2023. So just keep an eye on the channel so you can keep uh, up to date with the uh, with the things that are happening. We do have other Gulf War illness papers that I will be discussing soon that are actually looking at treatment, so you'll want to see that. Thanks.